Want to see how in one week I turned a lonely square into this using Game Maker's drag and drop? Well, keep watching and I'll show you how. G'day gamers. As many know, Game Maker by YoYo Games is a program that allows you to bring your gaming ideas alive in a quick and streamlined way. It also is really accessible, giving users two ways to build their game. Aimed at new users, the drag and drop method allows a visual approach to design, with the user dragging across code blocks to build their project. Game Maker also offers its custom language, called GML, or Game Maker language. This is a powerful way to build your game and what most people eventually veer towards. When you look at the Game Maker community, veteran users will warn newcomers to avoid drag and drop and head straight for GML. In the end, it's most likely inevitable if they want to get the most out of Game Maker. But with many people being visual learners, it offers them a comfortable experience. And if they are new to the program, any way to enter the community should be encouraged. So to demonstrate a decent game can still be produced using just drag and drop, I plan to build something in a week, using what I've learned over the years in GML, but applied to drag and drop. At the time, it was when self-isolation had been applied almost worldwide, so we had four people stuck in the house, my wife, my 10-year-old son, and my nine-year-old daughter. It was the perfect time to build a four-player versus co-op battle arena tank game. The idea was a simple single room with challenges delivered via spawning enemies. The concept of a polished completed game was not the goal. Instead, I wanted to build the basis of something fun and make it look flashy. So with the concept art out of the way, the first thing to implement was a tank-like movement system for the player. I created the movement variables and added the resetting of them to a script, which I added to the player's step event. I wanted to allow two people to use the keyboard, which allowed for two others on controllers. So I spent some time setting up the system to allow a player to use either the keyboard or a controller and mapped those to allow movement to the player. I then wanted to use speed and direction to move, even though I'm not a huge user of this as speed is applied automatically every step and I prefer to have control over when it's applied. It offered a simple way to give the tank movement though. So I added this in and brought in my old friend Blue Square to stand in for the player. Just like a tank, the player will need to rotate around in order to move forward, but the rotation happens automatically. Essentially, the tank will always try and face the direction the player moves the stick towards. Since the dual stick control method wouldn't work for a keyboard only system, I just made the standard left and right direction changes and a single up arrow or W press to move forward. In the end, the system I settled on had some acceleration and deceleration, which allowed for smooth stop and start movements and a nice feel. I also wanted a secondary movement system, which would be used for player knockbacks. So I added another system, which used extra variables for horizontal and vertical speeds. This would allow me to apply forces to the player, yet still allow them to move in their regular way. This means they could be knocked back by explosions or weapon recoil, and still keep their initial movement inertia. So I added this to a collision script alongside the existing speed variable in order to allow collisions to apply when making contact with walls. So with some walls in place, I could test the collisions. They worked perfect. Now one issue I had to correct was the player mask. The mask is the part of the sprite used for collisions, and I wanted to use a rectangular mask, but when you rotate the mask, the size changes because the rectangular dimensions actually change. To show you what I mean, here is the player sprite with the mask boundaries drawn in. When I rotate, the mask grows, meaning if I'm close to a solid, I would get stuck. This is because I'm rotating the sprite using the image angle, which is what determines a sprite's rotation. When it rotates though, the mask has this problem. The solution is to not actually change the image angle value. Instead, set a variable to hold the rotation and just draw the sprite using that variable. So now the mask actually stays in one location and only the sprite rotates. This enables a smooth movement when moving against solid objects, as well as consistent collisions with other objects. The next thing I wanted to add was the actual tank. 
Now it's a twin stick shooter, meaning we move with the left and aim with the right. So I needed to draw a tank with a turret separately so we could rotate the turret independently. We also needed four variations of color. Now I could use a shader or even image blending to change the color in Game Maker, but I was after specific colors and for time's sake, I just thought it would be faster to duplicate the sprite. So off to A-Sprite to draw up a basic tank. Not that basic, that's more like it. Now I place that in the game and well, we have a moving tank. The turret will be controlled by the right stick. So I added that as well and ensured the right stick movement was mapped to another variable, which allowed the tank to aim. Now it's time to give the tank the power to shoot. So I added this simple bullet as well as some color variations for testing. A shooting script later, giving the player some knockback and pew pew baby. What it needed though was some juice. So I spiced it up by adding some screen shake, particles, an impact sprite, some dust, and a little sound, which all together makes quite a difference. Now it started to feel good, so it was time to add something to shoot, an enemy. I found a tile set resource I had lying around, which had some mage-like characters, which were perfect for testing purposes. So I added them and gave them the ability to shoot at the player's location every few seconds. This worked fairly well, so the next enemy I made shot multiple times per attack, just for added variety. This was a little easy, so the next enemy needed to fire homing missiles. A reach into a homing script I wrote for my Space Udemy course meant this was done quickly. I was happy with the enemies, but needed more room to combine them. So I extended the room and used a tile set resource I had to create a dungeon-like environment. Dungeons, mages, tanks, yep, seems to make sense. Okay, it wasn't really in theme, but I didn't really have time to make all the graphics myself. Now I made it smaller since I had an idea of using the sides to show the player's status. Showing two on each side, I wanted a battle arena type room where the camera stayed in one location. I then added a layer over top and drew in the walls for the collisions. Red meant that everything collided with it and yellow meant that only players and enemies collided, allowing bullets to move over holes or the water. This worked fairly well, but I wanted the damage to show on the enemies and also enemies to show the impact of the bullets more. So in goes enemy and player health. Nintendo taught me that all good games need coins, so enemies now drop coins, as well as give score based on how tough they were. Also, who doesn't love sound? This started feeling much better. The player felt very static though, and needed some movement benefit to zip around the room. So I added a burst mechanic to give them a limited boost of speed when the left trigger is pressed. This made the player feel much more mobile, but also not too overpowering due to its use being on a cooldown. I also added some dust particles and a track behind the player to make the sprite feel more grounded in the environment. I needed to show the player's health and score as well as remaining boost. So I designed a GUI which was sized to allow two on each side of the screen. Once I'd placed them and aligned the player's stats, it really started to feel like a more complete game. Now that the player had health, I wanted a way to get health back. So since the tile set had a chest in it, I added that and when it was destroyed, it would spawn a wrench, which would heal you for one health. Cause you know, wrenches heal tanks. Now I gave the health a Z variable, which allowed me to give it height when it popped out of the chest, making it bounce on the ground. And the next great feature, explosions. So I made a barrel sprite, which exploded when shot. The barrel being destroyed created another object, which was a large explosion. It was this object that actually did the damage to the entities. And doing it like this will allow the explosion object to be called by anything else, and even scaled if needed, to deal damage over a wide area. The code uses a circular collision, based on a set damage radius, to generate a list of items that are affected, which are then in turn given damage. At this point, the enemies were not that difficult, so I added a tougher enemy, which exploded on death. This was lots of fun to avoid, or to not avoid. The game was coming along well, but it still felt very flat. I wanted to add some lighting effects, of which there are numerous methods. I went with surfaces, even though there are no specific surface code blocks. I could still use function calls to keep the code as drag and drop as possible. A surface is what the game draws to. They are just like pieces of clear film, 
which can be stacked together to draw the game. By default, the surface the game gets drawn to is the application surface. So I added an object which would create its own surface and would draw a dark rectangle over it, making the whole game darker. Next, I drew a simple glow sprite. And for the objects that I wanted to show light, they would draw to the light surface, this glow sprite, at their origin using the subtract blend mode. Now this means they are not adding the glow sprite to the surface, but instead removing pixels from it. Essentially punching a hole in the dark parts to reveal the application surface below, which is where the actual sprite is getting drawn. It's just like adding a mask like you would do in Photoshop. Now doing so in many objects means we end up with a light surface, which is then drawn subtracted over the application surface, giving us nice glowing objects. If I run the game in debug mode, you can actually view what this light surface looks like. And here is what it looks like in game. A vast improvement, I'm sure you'll agree. At this stage, the week was almost up and one of the goals of the game hadn't even been added. The concept of multiplayer was still missing. I had thought about it during the build and had set up some code to allow it, but actually getting it functional took longer than I thought, even though the other players are just instances of the player object with a different sprite color. It required me to set up arrays to store the positions of the GUI, the player glow colors, the start locations and start directions. I even managed to get back into Ace Sprite and design some better looking player tanks with individual colors. Eventually I finished the additional players and the family sat down to play test it. The game was a lot of fun, even in its very raw form. The enemies were a nice distraction, but hunting each other turned into the real challenge, with lots of laughs to be had during this test run. Afterwards I realized the glow colors were wrong and there were some things that could be added to improve the game, but time was up. I delved in drag and drop for a week straight, and to be honest, using it, even though cumbersome at times, had started to feel as comfortable as GML does normally. I feel there are facets it can improve on, and during that week I contacted YoYo Games around 10 times, submitting bugs and improvements which could improve the life of people using it daily. Now even though that was my week spent with drag and drop, and I produced something I'm very proud of in the time, you can always improve and it's hard to just drop a project that you've invested so much time into. So over the next few days I dabbled a little bit more. I added the spawning animation, which also damaged anyone around. It was simple to implement it as it used that exploding object when spawning. My daughter didn't really like being shot at, so I added some menu options using the same concept from my GML menu tutorial. This allowed for co-op, meaning no more friendly fire, which made her very happy to continue playing. Her other suggestion, along with my son's, uh, they weren't as helpful. I then gave the players a recharging shield based on damage done. This gave the game more of a strategy element and helped extend gameplay. Next was a grenade option you can throw at each other or the enemies. And lastly, I added the rapid fire weapon to give the chest more of an impact on gameplay. So after about 10 days, here's a video from the three of us trialing these new improvements. Sure, it's a little more than a week, but the core of what was there three days ago is still the same. If I get some time, I may end up continuing this project and see where it goes. I actually have some thoughts on a tutorial for a drag and drop top down twin stick shooter after doing all of this, so look for that in the future. In the meantime, I have a drag and drop series on making a platformer you may be interested in. There's links in the description. Now let's talk about subscribing. The numbers show a huge percentage of viewers don't subscribe, which makes it really hard to continue making content as your presence goes unnoticed. Please be noticed by clicking the subscribe button as it helps me produce more content. Lastly, I have a Udemy series which shows you how to make a tile-based platformer in Game Maker using GML. There's a link in the description which gives you a huge discount, so check that out if you're interested. You can also support me over on Patreon. My Patreon supporters really help make the channel possible, so a massive shout out to my current legendary supporters, Dylan Jackson and Fox and Raven Ent. I appreciate their generosity and support. Also a shout out to my epic supporters, Sky Devil Palm, Sheldon ENTP and John Woodard. They all help to make the content you are watching possible.
I'll be posting a special Patreon only video over there on how you can achieve the same lighting effect in your own game. So sign up over there if you're interested. All the links mentioned in the video are in the description. That's all for this one. Thanks for joining me. I'll talk to you in the next one.